Three and a half years after the stock market crash of 1929, the Great Depression was still gaining strength. Thousands of banks were failing every year, wiping out the savings accounts of 9 million people. One in four were out of work. Farmers couldn't get paid for their produce, and sometimes it would be left rotting in the fields as Americans starved. As the crisis spread around the globe, it was at this moment in 1933 when Adolf Hitler rose to power, becoming Chancellor of Germany. Liberal democracy had its chance, like capitalism, but it seemed like they both had failed. Some believed that they would never recover. As the country sank deeper into depression, workers had to accept pay cuts and job losses, while farmers' incomes were slashed, sometimes below the cost of production. That meant they couldn't keep up with their mortgages, and a devastating wave of foreclosures hit the Midwest and the South. Some farmers suffered quietly, but others rose up in rebellion. In Logan, Iowa in 1931, 500 farmers surrounded the courthouse there and managed to stop the foreclosure of their neighbor's farm. At an auction in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, one bidder offered only a dollar and 18 cents for an entire farm, while a mob of 300 did their best to discourage other bids. Then they handed the deed back to its rightful owner. Things like this were happening all over the countryside at the same time as the Communist Party led protests of the unemployed through city streets. Some thought that capitalism was coming to an end, and few would disagree that in that moment, it was a system unable to meet people's needs. In Mississippi, Governor Theodore Bilbo declared that, Some people are about ready to lead a mob. In fact, I'm getting a little pink myself. In Minnesota, Governor Floyd Olson halted all mortgage sales until farmers could get some relief. In North Dakota, Governor William Langer even mobilized the militia to prevent foreclosures. Then, in the summer of 1932, 20,000 veterans of the First World War marched on Washington to demand that they be paid a bonus for their efforts in that conflict. They were legally entitled to the bonus and were scheduled to receive it in 1945, but they wanted it early and they weren't taking no for an answer. I came to Washington to get my bonus and I'm gonna wait for it till I get it if I have to wait till 1945. It terrified President Hoover and his Secretary of War. They thought they were facing a communist uprising and they called in the army. With fixed bayonets and the support of six tanks, General Douglas MacArthur ordered his troops to advance. With cavalry advancing upon them, backed up by cold steel, there isn't much the veterans can do except give way. Two veterans were killed in the ensuing battle, and many were injured or arrested. Those who have fled to the shacks they called homes for months past are being driven out by tear gas bombs. The troops are mopping up now. It was a bad look to kill unemployed veterans, during an election year no less. The public was outraged. When Franklin Delano Roosevelt heard the news, he said to his advisor, Felix Frankfurter, Well, Felix, this elects me. Roosevelt won the election easily. But Hoover stayed on as president until March of 1933, while the Depression continued to deepen. During the lame duck period, Roosevelt's administration planned for the many challenges they would face, 
But what they didn't expect was not being able to get the cash to pay their hotel bills during Inauguration Weekend. The banking crisis had accelerated to the point of catastrophe, and the banks were closed in DC when FDR's entourage arrived in town. The day before the inauguration, the crisis reached a fever pitch as a run developed on the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. $200 million worth of gold reserves were drained in 24 hours. Was this the end? A month earlier, the lame duck Hoover administration was searching for answers. In desperation, they asked none other than Henry Ford for a loan to help keep the banks in Ford's state of Michigan open for business. Michigan was an industrial state that had been hard hit by the depression. And Ford had the cash, but he refused to help. Let the crash come. I feel young, I can build up again. 20 years after the creation of the Federal Reserve, the United States of America was still relying on the wealthiest people in the country to keep our banking system afloat. And sometimes, these wealthy individuals said no. Michigan's banks closed shortly after, and the banks in 31 other states soon followed. As Roosevelt was taking the oath of office, the banking system was in a state of total collapse, and the U.S. was facing its greatest crisis since the Civil War. The withered leaves of industrial enterprise lie on every side. Farmers find no markets for their produce, and the savings of many years in thousands of families are gone. And yet our distress comes from no failure of substance. We are stricken by no plague of locusts. Plenty is at our doorstep, but a generous use of it languishes in the very sight of the supply. Primarily, this is because the rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence, have admitted their failure and have abdicated. This nation is asking for action and action now. As president, FDR moved immediately to stop the export of gold and to shut the few remaining banks around the country that were still open. While gold export would be allowed again after the emergency passed, U.S. citizens would never again be allowed to convert their dollars directly to gold. Congress ratified the president's actions by passing the Emergency Banking Act. All banks would be closed until they could be examined closely enough to see if they'd be able to resume business. The strongest banks would be allowed to reopen first and the others would follow if and when they were able. On Sunday, March 12th, the day before the healthiest banks were scheduled to reopen, FDR addressed the nation by radio in his first fireside chat. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. It is possible that when the banks resume, a very few people who have not recovered from their fear, may again begin withdrawals. Let me make it clear to you that the banks will take care of all needs, and it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime in every part of our nation. It needs no profit to tell you that when the people find that they can get their money that they can get it when they want it for all legitimate purposes. The phantom of fear will soon be laid. I can assure you, my friends, that it is safer to keep your money in a reopened bank than it is to keep it under the mattress. This was the most successful presidential address in U.S. history. Sixty million people listened in. Although, 
On Monday, lines did start forming outside the reopened banks. But they weren't there to withdraw. They were coming to make a deposit. People believed Roosevelt that their gold, and whatever cash they had stashed away, would be safer in a bank. So hoarding it didn't make sense anymore. The people finally had a leader they could trust. And that trust carried over to the banking system. Capitalism was saved in eight days. But of course, there was a lot more that needed to be done. Congress quickly got to work on another banking bill passed later that year, which was intended to provide a more long-term solution. This was the famous Glass-Steagall Banking Act of 1933. The primary purpose of the act was to separate commercial banks, which take deposits from everyday customers, from investment banks, which trade in bonds, stocks, and sometimes cater to speculators. The idea was to prevent bankers from taking deposits from their regular customers and using them to fuel speculation. Now, they could still fund speculators all they wanted, even with this law. It's just a little harder. So the importance of separating investment and commercial banks has been debated. For what it's worth, I think it's important. And I know the big bankers hated it back then, and they still hated it in the 90s when they were finally able to get it repealed. The Glass-Steagall law is no longer appropriate to the economy in which we live. In the 90s, bankers had the power to get rid of legislation they didn't like. But in the 30s, they had no political power at all. Public opinion of financiers had crashed along with the stock market, especially after the revelations of a congressional investigation into big finance called the Pecora Commission. This commission was actually underway and was exposing all kinds of wrongdoing just as Congress was debating Glass-Steagall. They found that bankers engaged in reckless speculation. Outright fraud was commonplace, even accepted. And of course, there was widespread illegal tax evasion. Bankers had broken laws left and right for decades. And now with the Pecora Commission, everyone knew it. The public demanded action. Glass-Steagall passed overwhelmingly even though it included a very controversial amendment from Senator Arthur Vandenberg of Michigan. This is where the rubber meets the road. Vandenberg proposed a national system of deposit insurance. Today, we know that even if there's a bank failure, we'll still get our money back, up to $250,000 from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC. It feels so normal today that you might be surprised to learn that both Senator Carter Glass and President Roosevelt himself opposed the idea at first. They thought it was unworkable because the smaller banks would get into trouble and there'd be no way to stop them from bankrupting the whole system. That's what they thought. The American Bankers Association was livid over this amendment. Separating types of banking institutions was one thing, but they definitely didn't want to pay to support their less careful competitors. They called the amendment unsound, unscientific, unjust, and dangerous. But fortunately, no one cared what they thought anymore. They were in no position to negotiate this. Besides, the smaller bankers strongly favored it. Glass-Steagall, with Vandenberg's amendment, passed overwhelmingly and it was signed by the president on June 16th. And thank goodness. The naysayers were flat wrong on this one. The FDIC has been the most important improvement for the stability of our banking system ever. It stopped the bank runs of the 30s dead in their tracks. In 1931, over 2,000 banks had failed. By 1933, that number was up to 4,000. Just one year later, after the FDIC had been established, there were only 61 that failed, just nine of which were FDIC members. By 1945, 
only one U.S. bank failed the entire year. With the FDIC at their back, the small banks can't overwhelm the system because they don't fail. That's what the FDIC has given us, stability. It succeeded at being a true lender of last resort when the Federal Reserve has been completely unable. This failure didn't go unnoticed. Around this time, many in Congress and elsewhere were asking themselves, how had the Federal Reserve System failed us so spectacularly? As we saw last episode, the Fed was unwilling to stop the bubble in stock prices from expanding during the 20s. And the Federal Reserve Bank of New York had actually made the crisis worse by loaning money to speculators. On purpose! They did that even after the Federal Reserve Board in Washington told them not to. But how about after the crash? Did they at least help to clean up the mess at that point when everything had collapsed? Unbelievably, the answer is no. Today, the Fed would take action almost immediately to lower interest rates after a crash. But in the 20s, the New York Fed was the unofficial head of the system, even on things like raising or lowering interest rates, and the board in Washington really didn't do very much. After 1929, the New York Fed did take action to lower the discount rate, and some of the other reserve banks followed suit, but only slowly. And some reserve banks never did it. More importantly, even the New York Fed didn't start trying to lower the federal funds rate, which is the more important of the two, until 1932. That's in the third year of the Depression. By the way, if you're unsure of what the federal funds rate is, check out episode 11.5 here. So the Federal Reserve was basically useless during the Great Depression. Even Herbert Hoover knew that which is why he created the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. It was the RFC that made critical loans to banks and tried to keep them solvent until FDR could take over as president. The RFC also created Fannie Mae, and they played a crucial role in the financing of World War II. But back to the Federal Reserve, it had utterly failed and no one knew that better than Mariner Eccles, who Roosevelt had appointed chair of the Federal Reserve Board in November of 1934. After taking office, Eccles immediately got to work on a massive 20,000 word revision to the Federal Reserve Act, its first major revision since 1913. As we saw in episode 11, the original Federal Reserve Act was a careful balance between conservatives and progressives, and between bankers and the government. Eccles believed that whether the original bill had struck the right compromise or not, over the years, private bankers had taken control of the system. He wanted the pendulum to swing in the other direction and to give the Federal Reserve back to the government. Eccles' bill sailed through the House easily. Anti-banker sentiment across the country was still going strong, and some bankers actually sided with Eccles, particularly those out West. Western bankers thought they'd at least get a fair hearing with the government in charge instead of New York. Everything was going smoothly for Eccles until his bill reached the Senate. There it was stopped by the man who drafted the original Federal Reserve Bill. Senator Carter Glass was as adamantly opposed to government control in 1935 as he was in 1913. He rewrote Eccles' entire bill and even jeered. We did not leave enough of the Eccles' bill with which to light a cigarette. Eccles and Glass fought for months until Roosevelt finally announced his support for Eccles. After some final negotiations, 
The Banking Act of 1935 was made ready for the president to sign into law on August 23rd. During the signing ceremony, when Roosevelt offered Glass a pen, someone whispered, He should have given him an eraser instead. <laughs> but Eccles had the last laugh. Even after Glass's changes, the president still appoints the members of the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, which is now called the Board of Governors, just to make it clear who's in charge. After 1935, they'd be the ones to approve or disapprove of the presidents of the regional reserve banks. More importantly, they'd now be setting the discount rate and the reserve requirements for the entire country all at once. The regional reserve banks wouldn't be making these decisions for themselves anymore. The final bill also concentrated power over the federal funds rate into the new Open Market Committee. This committee is composed of all seven governors plus five of the 12 regional presidents at any one time. So if need be, the governors can outvote the bankers seven to five when it comes to setting interest rates. And again, any changes to this crucial interest rate would happen all across the country all at once, not piecemeal by region. These changes modernize the Federal Reserve System, and they allow it to stay relevant even today. For his efforts, Eccles got a building named after him. But Mariner Eccles didn't stop there. There was a lot more he wanted to see done. Together with other presidential advisors and cabinet members like Rex Tugwell, Lachlan Curry, and Harry Hopkins, Eccles thought the government could be doing much more to improve people's lives and to boost the economy at the same time. This group called for increased government spending on jobs programs and for public works, even at the cost of increasing the deficit. This kind of thinking is called Keynesianism after the theories of British economist John Maynard Keynes. This group was opposed by the conservatives in the cabinet, people like Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau, Budget Director Lewis Douglas, and sometimes FDR himself. In early 1937, when the economy finally seemed to be improving, FDR cut funding from the Public Works Administration and he slashed the Works Progress Administration, organizations which had been providing jobs for the unemployed. And around this time, the most popular program to come out of the New Deal, Social Security, had been passed and was ready to start. The work of Labor Secretary Francis Perkins, Social Security is a retirement program vitally important to reduce poverty for older Americans. It's a great program that, out of political necessity, is funded by a regressive payroll tax. And that tax began and started pulling money from workers' paychecks in 1937. Social Security wouldn't begin paying out to retirees until 1940. So until then, it would actually be a drain on the economy. The new Social Security tax and the cuts to relief spending caused the recovery to stall out in late 1937 in what's sometimes referred to as Roosevelt's Recession. By 1938, many Americans were again in very bad shape. Even so, Secretary Morgenthau gave Roosevelt a list of programs he wanted to see cut in order to balance the federal budget. Morgenthau thought balancing the budget would improve business confidence. And to that end, he was willing to sacrifice things like the National Youth Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and funding for the U.S. Housing Authority, flood control, public works, and highway construction. Roosevelt considered Morgenthau's plan carefully. But in the end, instead of cutting funding for these programs, he boosted it instead, across the board. In his 12th fireside chat, he framed this decision not only in economic terms, but also in terms of national security, referencing the rise of fascism in Europe. Democracy has disappeared. 
in several other great nations, disappeared not because the people of those nations disliked democracy, but because they had grown tired of unemployment and insecurity, of seeing their children hungry while they sat helpless in the face of government confusion. Finally, in desperation, they chose to sacrifice liberty in the hope of getting something to eat. Roosevelt knew that for democracy to stand a chance, the recovery had to keep moving forward and unemployment had to drop. For now, I'll try to sum up the New Deal, even though <laughs> this is impossible. There was so much accomplished from the vital jobs programs of the WPA and PWA to the ambitious Tennessee Valley Authority project to other important pieces of legislation like the Securities Exchange Act, the National Labor Relations Act, and the Fair Labor Standards Act that abolished child labor, set the 40-hour work week, and the first national minimum wage. This video could be an hour long. And while I'd love to sing FDR's praises and tell you how important the New Deal has been to the country, I should say first that it was built off the efforts of the Herbert Hoover administration. These policies were new, but they weren't radical. If FDR was willing to provide the fiscal stimulus the economy needed, he could have cut the Depression short and prevented a lot of unnecessary suffering. But its worst flaw was that the New Deal never addressed the plight of black Americans, even though they were dealing with much higher levels of unemployment and poverty than were white Americans. For example, Roosevelt didn't lift a finger for a federal anti-lynching bill, even though one was drafted by the NAACP in 1933. White Southern farmers were an important part of the Democratic coalition in the 30s, and Roosevelt didn't want to risk alienating them. In fact, many New Deal programs denied black people equal opportunity, often because hiring decisions were made by locals. Simply put, the New Deal was designed to help white people only. But when it comes to the financial system, the importance of what they did in the 30s really can't be overstated. Thanks to people like FDR, Mariner Eccles, and even Carter Glass, the New Deal brought a new era of stability to our banking system and modernized the Federal Reserve. No longer would there be a banking crisis every 7 to 15 years like there had been for the past century. While the system still isn't always stable, people these days at least tend to expect stability instead of expecting a crisis around every corner. The feeling that our banking system should be stable is a legacy of the New Deal and of a monumental international agreement on exchange rates called Bretton Woods that would be forged at the end of World War II. But that's a few years in the future. By the end of the 30s, U.S. unemployment remained stubbornly high as the cloud of fascism threatened to engulf Europe. Nazi tanks overwhelmed Poland in three weeks. And France, a major world power, lasted only six. The German economy was reborn and seemed to supercharge at the same time Western democracies were still suffering from the Depression. On the home front, President Roosevelt had managed to stabilize American capitalism and democracy. But only time would tell if he could do the same on the world stage. Next episode, we'll see the global economy melted down in the fires of war and reforged stronger than ever through the Bretton Woods Summit.